We're going to go ahead and get started. Are you okay with that? I think it's cranking, so. The committee will come to order. The uh, opening statements for myself and our ranking member, Mr. Connolly, I'm going to have submitted for the record in writing so we can go ahead and just move on uh, as quickly as we can. I do have one uh, letter that I'm also asking for uh, unanimous consent to be able to submit it for the record, a letter to uh, Doug Ellendorf, and uh, with, uh, with no other uh, reason for, to um, deny that, I would assume that we can receive that by unanimous consent on that. Uh, basic ground rules of the hearing. Each of you has been asked to submit a written statement for the record. We have also asked you to prepare an oral opening statement no longer than five minutes, so we can allow time for questions and discussion after your statement. You will see on your desk a series of lights and a clock which will count down from five minutes. I know you all have been briefed on this already. Uh, after the entire panel has given their oral statements, we will have a few questions for you. We will do those questions in four-minute increments and uh, get a chance just to clip through that as well. Uh, we will be strictly enforcing the time today. Obviously, we have a very tight schedule that has been interrupted by votes. Uh, so we are grateful that you are here and that you have taken a significant amount of time to be able to prepare your testimony. Uh, do you have any questions about uh, going through the oral portion of this? Thank you. I would uh, like to now read the uh, mission statement of our committee, and then we will swear you in. We exist to secure, as the Oversight and um, Government Reform Committee, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. It is our solemn responsibility to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers do have the right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, we have three witnesses that we are receiving testimony from today. The Honorable Joni Cutler is a member of the South Dakota State Senate representing the 14th District of South Dakota, serves in the Executive Committee of the National Conference of State Legislatures. Prior to service in the State Senate, Senator Cutler served in the South Dakota State House of Representatives for eight years. Thanks for being here. Mr. Raymond Keating is the Chief Economist at the Small Business and Entrepreneur Council and, uh, and serves as an adjunct professor in the Business School at Downing College. And Mr. John Arnsmeyer is the founder and CEO of the Small Business Majority. Prior to that, he was the Chief Operating Officer of a multimedia business and an attorney in New York. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it is our typical uh, practice here that we swear in uh, guests when they come uh, in the hearing time. So if you please, please rise and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you God? Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the, in the affirmative. Please be seated. I would like to uh, receive the uh, testimony first from uh, Joni Cutler, and please, uh, you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good afternoon, Chairman Langford, Ranking Member Conley, and distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Technology, Information Policy, Intergovernmental Relations, and Procurement Reform. I'm Senator Joni Cutler, a member of the South Dakota Senate. I'm also a member of the Executive Committee of the National Conference of State Legislatures, on whose behalf I'm testifying. NCSL is a bipartisan organization representing the 50 state uh, legislatures and the legislatures of our nation's Commonwealth, Territories, and District of Columbia. I am very appreciative of this opportunity to testify on the State's experience with unfunded and underfunded Federal mandates. This hearing is particularly timely for three reasons. First, legislative, regulatory, and fiscal burdens the Federal Government imposes on State and local governments are often overlooked and, and frequently underappreciated. Second, we have just celebrated the 16th anniversary of the enactment of the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act and have learned much about its effectiveness and drawbacks that I will share with you today. Third, Congress and the administration are embarking on an effort to rein in annual deficits and manage the national debt. And that effort will unavoidably put on the table state federal partnerships, intergovernmental relationships, and basic issues regarding fiscal federalism. In 1995, NCSL and our fellow, fellow state and local national organizations hailed the bipartisan passage and enactment of UMRA. That law enhanced the visibility of potential unfunded federal mandates and cost shifts and in some instances changed the nature of the discussions leading to passage of Federal legislation. It has led to the development of an able division within the Congressional Budget Office that produces vital intergovernmental mandate analysis and an annual report on UMRA. UMRA's procedural hammer, or more so the threat of using this hammer, has seemingly acted to douse some efforts to impose unfunded mandates and shift costs to states and localities. 
A reading of any annual CBO report on UMRA shows how few mandated actions exceed the loss threshold. However, UMRA's limitations make it a candidate for improvement and strengthening. And legislation accomplish accomplishing such originating in this subcommittee would be very helpful. UMRA's limits will not serve the essential conversation needed to address reduced future Federal funding or discretionary or mandatory programs. Its limits, loopholes, much the result of negotiations that took place 16 years ago omit many mandates in the eyes of State legislators and other State and local elected officials. These omissions include new conditions of grants and aid, reduction of Federal funds without commensurate reduction in program or administrative requirements, sanctions for failure to comply with unfunded mandates, and creation of underfunded national expectations. Therefore, NCSL is urging a three-pronged approach to improve UMRA, broaden, its co broaden cooperation and discussion on State and Federal programs. First, NCSL's policy supports legislation that will correct UMRA's limitations. For example, H.R. 2255 from the 111th Congress serves as an excellent example of bipartisan-sponsored legislation that would enjoy support from me and my fellow lawmakers if offered again in the 112th Congress. Such legislation needs to include open-ended entitlements in any mandatory or entitlement program with capped Federal funding participation in the definition of an unfunded mandate. It should also eliminate program exclusions in the underlying current statute and include new conditions imposed through older programs under the definition of a mandate. It must also include conditions of grants in aid. And among several points made in my written testimony, a revised UMRA law should require Federal reimbursement to State and local governments for costs imposed on them by any new Federal mandates for as long as the mandate exists. Second, the House and Senate budget resolutions for FY12 should contain general instructions to appropriators and committees of jurisdiction to avoid creating or expanding existing unfunded or underfunded mandates. I urge this subcommittee's membership to prod your leadership and budget committee chairs to include this instruction in the FY2012 and subsequent year budget resolutions. Third, finally, there are several pending reauthorizations before the 112th Congress. For the most part, committees other than oversight and government reform have jurisdiction over them. However, any effort to reauthorize an existing program, such as No Child Left Behind, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Block Grant, and the Safety Lou Transportation Program should be seen as an opportunity for this subcommittee to explore repeal or minimize the provisions that shift costs to States. They should also be seen as opportunities to provide program and administrative savings for all levels of government simultaneously while maintaining essential public services. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Conley, NCSL offers to work together with you to address what are hopefully mutual concerns regarding these authorizations. Mr. Chairman, thank you for inviting me and the National Conference of State Legislatures to testify before you today. I look forward to responding to questions subcommittee members may have. Thank you very much. Mr. Keating. Uh, are we counting? I'm sorry. We'll try it again. Okay. I have two graduate degrees. I think you should be able to handle this. Uh, Chairman Langford, uh, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the committee, the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council is pleased to provide testimony today regarding the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act and how it relates to small business and the economy. My name is Raymond Keating. I am Chief Economist with SBE Council, a nonpartisan nonprofit advocacy research and training organization dedicated to protecting small business and promoting entrepreneurship. SBE Council works with leaders at local, state, federal, and international levels to improve the environment for entrepreneurship and enhance competitiveness. Unfortunately, government too often erects obstacles to improving the climate for entrepreneurship and to enhance, enhancing uh, the competitiveness of U.S. businesses, including regulations and mandates that raise costs, diminish incentives and resources for risk-taking, reduce opportunities, and or create uncertainty. Uh, I am also an adjunct professor at the Business School at Dowling College in New York. Uh, in the MBA program, I frequently teach public sector economics, in which I emphasize the importance of understanding the incentives at work not just in the private sector, but in the public sector as well. And in fact, powerful incentives exist within the governmental and political spheres when it comes to imposing mandates given the ability to take governmental action while others deal with the costs. It is also critical to understand that the costs of regulations and mandates fall much harder on small businesses. Small businesses often lack adequate resources, both in terms of dollars and staff, to deal with the additional costs that come with governmental mandates. Uh, 
For good measure, the taxes needed to fund intergovernmental mandates come from small businesses and their customers. Given the powerful incentives at work and often substantial costs, it is important to have some kind of institutional checks and balances in the system when it comes to unfunded mandates. Uh, UMRA, which SBE Council supported, is one of those counterbalancing measures. Uh, it has been beneficial by providing additional information about the direct costs of unfunded Federal mandates. Uh, injecting the issue of cost further into the debate and discussion is a positive development from the small business perspective. However, problems do exist or, more accurately, shortcomings. Uh, first, uh, I will name three very quickly. First, new regulations being proposed under the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act have the potential to restrict access to and raise the cost of capital and credit for small business owners. Uh, proposed Federal Reserve rules regarding interchange fees, for example, could make a currently challenging problem much worse for small businesses. Uh, yet uh, the independent regulatory agencies that issue the, will, will be issuing these rules and are issuing these rules are exempt from UMRA. Uh, second, the FCC no, uh, voted in December to impose net neutrality regulations on Internet broadband providers. The FCC inserting itself into pricing and operational decisions would have consequences for investment and innovation in broadband, with small businesses likely experiencing negative consequences as consumers, content providers and app entrepreneurs, for example. But the FCC is another independent agency not covered by UMRA. Uh, third, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act included unfunded mandate burdens far exceeding the thresholds in UMRA. Those costs affect either directly or indirectly small businesses. Unfortunately, uh, recognition that this massive health care measure did exceed the threshold levels of UMRA meant little in terms of legislative reality, which raises some question about UMRA's ultimate impact. I would like to just quickly note six problems and limitations that require some remedies. <coughs> First, among the most glaring and troubling is that the law does not cover a large swath of Federal mandates, including rules issued by independent regulatory agencies. Uh, number two, shortcomings with UMRA's point of order provisions need to be remedied by having both informational and substantive points of order apply to legislative and agency mandates on both government and the private sector. Third, problems regarding costs must be remedied. Uh, indirect costs impacting such areas as prices, risk-taking economic growth and employment need to be considered. Uh, fourth, when it comes to agency mandates, uh, an independent entity such as the GAO, a separate entity within OMB, or an independent office should have responsibility for evaluating the costs of such mandates. Uh, fifth, the judicial review included in UMRA lacks teeth, to say the least, and offers no real incentives to challenge agencies or for agencies to deal more legitimately with UMRA requirements. Uh, sixth, UMR needs to be built upon or amended to establish means for evaluating the effectiveness, the actual costs, and the emergence of unintended consequences of existing regulations and mandates. Requiring sunsetting and periodic evaluation of existing regulations and mandates makes sense given the realities of a dynamic economy. Along with this, a required congressional vote on all rules, mandates, and regulations being proposed would enhance accountability. SB Council <clears throat> appreciates the opportunity to provide the input to the committee, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, and I recognize Mr. Arnsmeyer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Chairman Lankford, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the committee. Small Business Majority is a nonpartisan small business advocacy organization founded and run by small business owners. We represent 28, the, the 28 million Americans who are self employed or own businesses of up to 100 employees. Our organization uses scientific opinion and economic research to understand and represent the issues, the interests of all small businesses. I ran two small businesses for 15 years and have run a nonprofit organization for the past five. Other members of our senior team have long careers as entrepreneurs. As such, we are well aware there are times when small businesses are overburdened by government regulation and that regulation often affects small businesses more than big businesses. This is why we support President Obama's initiative to review government regulation on business and we support the Small Business Administration's role in monitoring compliance of the Regulatory Flexibility Act. We share the view that any regulations that impact small businesses should be carefully scrutinized, and we support the requirements already in the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act that require government to analyze and report um, on the impacts of new regulations. That said, there is a legitimate role for government in passing laws that address private sector business activity. Business owners are pragmatic, bottom line oriented, and preventing or delaying all regulation that might in some way affect small business would be short sighted and could actually remove an important tool that can stimulate small business innovation and contain costs. 
Indeed, our research has shown that small business supports government as a facilitator and an arbiter that sets rules of the road. The effects of legislation on the private sector should be carefully considered as, as each bill is being debated, not via a blanket, one-size-fits-all approach. The first items on small businesses' list of concerns are the need for customers and finding ways to deal with burdensome expenses. In many cases, government can help. I am going to focus on two successful examples of this, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and the Clean Air Act. The number one problem we hear from small businesses about is the cost of health care. Small businesses want to offer health coverage, but our scientific bipartisan surveys show that 86 percent of them cite cost as the biggest barrier. A major study that we conducted found that without reform, small employers would pay $2.4 trillion over the next 10 years, costing us 178,000 jobs and $52.1 billion in profits. This crisis compelled Congress to take action. The status quo was just simply unacceptable. The Affordable Care Act addresses all these issues and more, while reducing the Federal deficit by more than $200 billion over the next 10 years and more than $1 trillion over 10 years after that. Our research shows that 4 million small businesses, that is 84 percent of all businesses, are eligible for tax credits in the law, and that 33 percent of them tell us in the scientific polling we have done that they are more likely to cover their employees because of the tax credits and the marketplaces that are being set up under the law starting in 2014. For example, Mark Hodesh, owner of Downtown Home and Garden in Ann Arbor, Michigan, qualified for a $15,000 tax credit this year. Knowing he had that credit gave him the confidence to add another person to his staff. His new employee, who was unemployed previously, now has a job and is contributing to the economy by paying taxes and buying goods. Government support to the clean energy sector of the economy is also providing much-needed aid to small business. Indeed, without a strong government role in setting goals and standards, we will never successfully compete in the interconnected 21st century global economy that is becoming more and more centered on innovative clean energy solutions. Over the last 40 years, the Environmental Protection Agency has proven itself as much a protector of the economy as of the public's health. Indeed, during the last two decades under the Clean Air Act, the gross domestic product has increased 64 percent, while emissions of the most common air pollutants have declined by 41 percent. Between 2010 and 2015 alone, capital investments in pollution controls and new generation will generate an estimated 1.46 million jobs. And the EPA's clean air standards for automobiles are projected to save owners $3,000 per vehicle, with this amount rising to $7,400 for 2017 to 22, 2022 model vehicles. This will have a substantial benefit for small business owners, especially for those businesses who rely on transportation. Our bipartisan polling shows that 61 percent of small businesses agree that moving the country to clean energy is a way to start the economy, restart the economy, and make their businesses more competitive. A majority supports an active role for government in this process. For example, the Clean Air Act and regulating greenhouse gases helps Cody Metcalf, president of LED light distributor Winderlumen LED in Windermere, Florida. Cody says if someone is paying attention to greenhouse gases, then there is more demand for our product. As these examples show, a constructive partnership between business and government can provide economic opportunity and can help entrepreneurs cut some of the unnecessary and onerous costs of doing business. Wielding a legislative hammer rather than employing a judicious and precise scalpel risks quashing a role for government that is often a boon to small business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, based on a prior agreement that I have with the ranking member, I am going to recognize myself for four minutes, and we will do four-minute questioning time on that. Senator Keller, thank you for being here. Thank all of you for being here, in fact, and uh, for your testimony, both written and oral. Um, I would like to also add that if anyone else wanted to be able to submit a statement, uh, that they could certainly do that uh, in writing, and we will receive those for the next seven days. Um, Senator Cutler, you make a couple of terms on there. You talk about statutory caps, for instance, and uh, talking about when caps are then added, you would like to have some basic statutory relief that would offset that, uh, that it may be a situation where you are not looking for additional funds but looking for initial offsets. Can you elaborate more on that, what you mean? Well, I think uh, really the uh, if I could make one point and, and have one takeaway point for you today, it would be that um, in all of this, what we're really looking for is a, uh, the difference between theory and effect, really the idea that whatever is in the statute should clearly reflect the effect that it's going to have on the states as we struggle so hard right now in these times to balance our budgets. So um, any time we have a, a cap, then we look toward what, what is it the states would have to do to remedy that cap. And we should be able to clearly identify uh, through the process 
what, what it is that is going to take place at a State-by-State -state level. And, and that would be so very helpful to us in planning our budgets. Okay. You also made a statement about uh, changing the term direct cost or expenditure to a reasonably foreseeable direct cost or indirect cost. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that as well? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, those indirect costs really are, are described now under the definition as an indirect cost, but in reality, they, they still have to come up and take their place in our budgets. And so by including the things, um, by, by including things that are presently exempted, by identifying the cost shifts that uh, any piece of legislation may have on uh, shifting the burden of cost to the States that they presently don't have, and then adding um, to the definition those changes that are made in the programs that presently exist, we will help the States go a long way in really planning for uh, taking care and coming into compliance uh, with the requirements of the Federal legislation that you pass. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Keating, you made some very specific recommendations, and one of them you were talking about independent agencies uh, that are exempted from UMRA. Uh, any specific examples that you can note? I know you didn't have a lot of time in your opening statement about dealing with the independent agency. Uh, you mentioned SEC at one point, but other examples you can give us on that? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> I mentioned the FCC um, in terms of uh, what they are doing in terms of uh, uh, net neutrality regulation. Uh, I talked about the new consumer protection agency right. that is being developed. Um, these are all going to have uh, clear impacts on the small business community, what they are putting forward. I mean, net neutrality regulation, it is not just the big broadband providers. When you look at all the costs, again, getting right. to, to all the costs in the equation, uh, it is going to be felt throughout the economy and small businesses and entrepreneurs. Do you see any reason why Congress, when they are making a decision about a particular piece of legislation, should not be informed, even if it affects some independent agency, why the lack of information is somehow beneficial? Yeah, no, I, I don't understand that. And quite frankly, I would say that there shouldn't be any exclusions here across the board because we're talking about information here. And in my view, more information is the better. You, the more information you have, the better decisions you can make. So no matter what we're talking about, whether it's independent uh, regulatory agency or legislation uh, or all those other areas, quite frankly, they're excluded. I don't understand why they should be ex why they are excluded. We should have more information so we can make better intelligence decisions. Uh, be my perception as well. Mr. Arnsmeyer, thank you. you. You mentioned several things that became uh, it just regulatory benefits to smaller business, but in your opening statement you made several statements about there are some burdensome things that government does on to small businesses on that. But you, you didn't mention any particular. Are there any particular areas that you look at in specific and say this does become burdensome for us? Well, there is always a potential any time uh, you are passing legislation, and we certainly endorse uh, that Congress needs to have all the information about the potential burdens. I mean, obviously one thing that comes to mind now is that the uh, 1089 provision that is in the uh, health care law, um, you know, we, it should not have been there. It is it's, it's a burden with not a very much you know, uh, okay. benefit coming the other way, and we certainly wish that would go away as quickly as possible. Okay. We are working on that. Uh, now I would like to recognize the Ranking Member, Mr. Connolly, for four minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Keating, um, when Congress passed the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, a lot of small businesses and industries claimed that the cost of electricity would skyrocket, putting extreme financial pressure on individuals and small businesses' electric bills. In fact, did that materialize? Uh, I would have to take a look at exactly uh, the provisions you are talking about and what the results of it were. So I, I can't. Well, I mean, is it your impression that between 1990 and now electric bills have skyrocketed, I live in putting York, an undue so financial yeah. burden on small businesses? <laughs> um, I live in New York, so yes, I would have to answer yes to that. But I would have to take a look at it, specifically those provisions and see what the, the results were, because you have to obviously factor in a whole host of other measures that would come into play in terms of impacting the cost. Mr. Arnsmeyer, is that your impression? Uh, our impression is that the opportunities that have been created by the, um, the environmental regulations of the EPA have spurred a tremendous boon to uh, new industries in this country, new industries that are likely to um, be able to more adequately compete around the world. And all the studies that have been done about increased costs have shown that there have been um, small or, or little, and they are completely offset by in improvements in, in energy efficiency that are driven by the desire to move um, toward a more energy efficient economy. I, I mention it because we heard many of the same arguments 20 years ago on Clean Air Act amendments uh, in terms of their impact on small businesses 
almost none of which, dire predictions, that is, came true, as a matter of fact, quite the opposite, as you insist. Uh, you, you brought up health care um, and, and, and how the assertion that health care imposes onerous regulations in small businesses requiring them to offer health insurance. Do you know what percentage of small businesses fall under the 50 employee threshold? Uh, but four, and, about 4 percent of businesses in this country are, have over 50 employees, and of those 4 percent, 96 percent of those already offer insurance. So let me get this straight, Mr. Arnsmeyer. Therefore, 96 percent of all small businesses are exempt Correct. from these so-called onerous regulations Correct. in requiring health care coverage for their employees. And of the remaining 4 percent of small businesses in America, 96 percent already offer health care insurance. Correct. And would, therefore would also be exempt from this onerous regulation, yes. since they already provide. Thank you. Um, the EPA issued a tailoring rule that limits greenhouse gas pollution regulations to sources that emit more than 75,000 tons of carbon dioxide annually. Is there a single small business that would have a pollution source exceeding this extremely high threshold, Mr. Keating? Uh, I'm not, I, I would have to, take, again, take a look at the details of that, but of course small businesses are going to be affected if costs rise for utility firms and manufacturing. So even if you see higher costs on larger firms and on utilities, that obviously is going to affect small businesses. Mm -hmm. Mr. Arnsmar? Um, my understanding is that, I mean, you have limits on the traditional um, um, emissions, um, sulfur dioxide, things like that, and those completely exempted any, there is no possible way any small business would fall under those. And then with the greenhouse gas um, rules, they have raised that substantially, so it kind of matches up with the size of the, of the facilities that would be um, covered by the traditional uh, pollutants. And so basically, under, even under the greenhouse gas rules, there is no way any small business would be directly impacted by that. And the indirect impacts are, um, so we have seen figures like, you know, half of a cent which is, you know, that is on, on a unit basis. And when you start to look at the energy efficiency across the whole economy, uh, the costs are going to come down uh, dramatically as we, as we sort of move in that direction. Real quickly, thank you. Senator Cutler, real quickly, I also came from local government, spent 14 years in local government. Um, do you see a difference between unfunded mandates with respect to State and local government and the regulation of private industry? Are those two different things? I think, uh, th and thank you for the question, uh, I think oftentimes there is an overlap. Um, you can't often move one piece without a resulting effect on the other piece. So um, I don't know if I'm getting to the heart of your question or not, but we certainly hear from our local governments often in the legislature as uh, regarding all of the things that we do and the impact that they have. And, and I think that is part of why we are here today, is to say we really need uh, to make sure that all of the work that we do is uh, that people clearly understand the impact on their business and on State government and on local government. Thank you. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I recognize Mr. Farenthold for four minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I think I want to start off with Mr. Keating. Uh, you have heard Mr. Arsenmeyer's testimony uh, indicating that the Affordable Care Act and uh, Clean Air Act have actually uh, created more jobs. That goes very much against what I hear from the folks back home in South Texas and that the burdens that, that uh, the Affordable Care Act would place and that uh, certainly the EPA's overzealous uh, enforcement of the Clean Air Act and expansion of it uh, in Texas and taking that over from the Texas State Government is adversely affecting business. Would your members agree with Mr. Arsenmeyer's statement? Uh, no. Uh, we have uh, some 100,000 members, uh, and you can pick and choose your studies, but if you want to look at the greenhouse gas uh, regulations, uh, the overwhelming uh, work that has been done on this shows that costs are going to skyrocket in terms of the cost of carbon-based energy. Uh, there's, there's no way you can reduce emissions or cap emissions without, in effect, raising the costs of carbon-based energy. That's the reality of it. Uh, and we're, when you look at how that uh, spreads throughout the economy, it's going to be uh, a devastating, I would argue, a devastating impact on small businesses, on our competitiveness. Uh, and for the, in terms of the Health Care Reform Act, again, our members would, would strongly disagree. Uh, you can go down the line, the pay or play mandate, the individual mandate. 
uh, the, uh, the dictates on what, what exactly is the government going to mandate through these exchanges that we have. Uh, we keep hearing that we are going to have more competition and choice. I think it is more of a vehicle for mandates and regulations. So all the way down the board, I think uh, these issues are major, major costs, worries, and, and they certainly create a tremendous amount of uncertainty for small business. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Cutler, I was wondering if in your state it was similar to what we experienced in Texas, that the delay uh, associated with uh, complying with uh, specifically Federal regulations and getting things like highway projects or building projects uh, permitted through the various agencies uh, really seems to take an excessive amount of time. The numbers I hear are between three and seven years and drive the costs up significantly. Are you seeing that uh, in your state as well? Yes, and in fact, uh, one example I'd like to give you is is one that we don't often think of, and that is the Adam Walsh uh, Sex Offender Registry Notification Act. Um, I've been involved in several uh, attempts to find out through the rulemaking process what and the Department of Justice just what the responsibilities for complying coming into compliance would be, and even after two through two administrations and five years of extensions to come into compliance, I, I believe there are still at this point only four states that have been able to come into compliance. And it is not because they aren't trying. And, and states have a lot to lose. Their burn grant funds hinge on coming into compliance with Adam Walsh and SORNA. So it is an example of the very thing you are talking about. All right. I have less than a minute left, but I wanted to just do a quick question to each of the members of the panel. There are some proposals being bantered around in this Congress for perhaps a 24-month moratorium on new Federal regulations, just to give businesses time to uh, catch up and get, catch their breath and get going. How, what, would you, what would each of you feel about that? Well, I, I think a 24-month, if, if that is all it is, uh, doesn't go far enough to help us, and, and I don't mean in terms of the time, I mean in terms of uh, the, the consultation and the dialogue that needs to go on on the impact of regulations and the input from the states in making those rules and regulations. Mr. Keating. Uh, any kind of break that we can get from regulations would be much appreciated, I think, from the business community, yes. Um, I guess we would uh, feel that a one-size-fits-all is not the way to go, that we, we strongly endorse that they, that um, uh, every piece of legislation be looked at carefully and analyzed, but because so much of what government does in partnership with business, uh, and I have cited the two examples, um, pretty large examples, um, you know, has, brings benefit that I think this needs to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, well, I am out of time. Thank you all very much. No, thank you. This is a very important issue for us, and I know that we have been rushed and getting a chance to get, get through all this. Both your oral and your written statements are vital and will obviously be kept in the Congressional record, and so we get a chance to refer back to them in the days to come. This is our second hearing. It is very important to both of you here. We heard from county governments and city governments last time, as well as oversight. Uh, obviously, UMRA affects State governments and affects the private sector as well, specifically noted uh, into that law. And so it is important to be able to get your perspective, and I thank you very much for your time. Uh, with that, other members Mr. may submit something. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Could I just note for the record that, obviously, at least on this side of the aisle, we make a profound distinction between the issue of unfunded mandates on State and local governments and the issue of regulation on business. They are two separate animals. They are not related, and we believe that if we are going to have hearings on unfunded mandates, they should stick to the former, not the latter. I do. I understand that very well, and uh, we have discussed that uh, as well. But obviously, UMRA references both of them, so we want to get a chance to have hearings based on both of them together. So I appreciate very much your time. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.